Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar, hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at infusing mathematical modeling into your classroom. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts. <clears throat> Excuse me, accessible to all my students. So I am excited to be joined by our three panelists, Curtis Brown, Gail Burrell, and Tom Dick. Tom is a senior math advisor for Texas Instruments and is also a professor and former chair of the math department of Oregon State University. He served on the editorial panels for the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education and the Mathematics Teacher Educator. He remains active in the college board's AP Calculus program. In 2008, Tom was inducted by the Oregon Council of Teachers of Mathematics into the Oregon Council Mathematics Education Hall of Fame. Tom, it's great to have you with us. Great to be here. Thanks, Mike. And Gail is also a senior math advisor for Texas Instruments, and she was a secondary math teacher in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for over 28 years. Uh, currently, she is a math specialist in the program for math education at Michigan State University, and she served as president of NCTM as director of the Mathematical Sciences Education Board. She received a Presidential Award for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching and the NCTM Lifetime Achievement Award. Gail is currently, again, a senior math advisor for TI in education technology. Gail, it's great to have you with us tonight. And Curtis is the market segment manager for Texas Instruments, uh, heading up the mathematics education market. He is, uh, I'm sorry, he is heading up the development of the content-based math programs, such as the Math and Action series, Math and Motion series. Curtis was an AP statistics and algebra two teacher in Houston, and worked as a statistics content specialist at the National Math and Science Initiative. Curtis, it's great to have you with us tonight. Man, I'm happy to join you guys this evening. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions to Curtis, Gail, or Tom using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. At this point, Tom is going to discuss our agenda. Great. Uh, so Mike's uh, handled the welcome and introduction. So what we'd like to do with you uh, this evening is uh, give you an introduction to uh, mathematical modeling in the classroom with TI technology. Uh, we've uh, been working, Gail and I uh, have been working with Curtis on a variety of uh, projects and activities, and we've selected some of those to go over with you tonight. Uh, one of those is on uh, CO2 levels, that some data I think you'll find really interesting. Uh, we'll also look at uh, uh, using data on NFL quarterbacks to come up with a rating. Uh, and as time permits, we may get into a, another uh, data set that on, has to do with mantids and, uh, and their prey and how, when and how they strike. Uh, then Curtis will be uh, looking at some resources for modeling, and uh, Michael tell us more about the webinar drawing. Thanks so much, Tom. Be sure to stick around to the end of the webinar. Uh, one lucky winner will win a T Cubed International Conference registration. And Gail is going to discuss our expected outcomes. So tonight we're actually hoping that. Um, you guys will leave this session with some new strategies for thinking about modeling in your classroom. Um, you'll think about different kinds of modeling, um, recognizing the role of TI technology in the whole process, and 
one of our, our desires and hopes is that we'll come away with the idea that modeling is beyond pushing regression buttons. Thanks so much, Gail. Curtis, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. Right. Right. So we thought we would start by giving you a little bit background. There's a lot of definitions floating around out there about what mathematical modeling is. So we are kind of using the one from the GAMI report um, that says it's trying to use mathematics to make sense of things in the real world and questions that we have. Um, and so the way we've been thinking about this modeling work is that we kind of categorized our work and our projects into four different categories. Um, one is thinking about ratings in order to make some kind of a value comparison or judgment. Another one is to think about optimization questions. Um, a third category is to think about predictions. Um, and finally, how can we use simulations to help us understand things in the real world? Um, we want to be sure that what we're doing tonight is primarily, is, will really be on the TI Inspire, but all of the data sets are also available on the 84. And you can do many of the things that we're going to do on an 84. We just didn't want to go hopping back and forth between um, both devices right now tonight. But you can access the data um, for uh, an 84 as well as for the Inspire. I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Okay. Uh, so the first um, data set we're going to look at uh, has to do with CO2 or carbon dioxide emissions, um, or actually what we'll be looking at is data that is collected uh, from the Mauna Loa Observ Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, this slide here just gives you a little bit of background. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions are very much in the news. Um, they're um, burning fault. Fossil fuels um, are some of the things that contribute to it. Um, and folks are looking at these CO2 levels very closely for the possible connections they might have to global warming. So, so um, we've got some neat data that's been gathered from this observatory. Uh, what we have are some monthly readouts of the uh, carbon dioxide levels from month to month over several years. So we're going to take a look at this next slide. And here is an example of those carbon dioxide levels. Uh, they're measured in parts per million. And these are the monthly uh, emission uh, uh, data readings uh, where the month is, month one would be January of 2018 month two would be February, and so on through month 12 would be December of 2018. So you can look at these uh, carbon dioxide levels. And what we'd ask you is just to, to pause and, and take a look at those uh, and see what you can tell from the numbers. Is there anything that you're noticing, uh, anything that you're wondering about? And feel free to uh, weigh in on the uh, yeah, chat screen if you'd like. Tom, just for clarity, these are all from 2018, right? That's right, yeah. And so there is uh, January through December, the monthly readings. I so see from, from Riverside High School says, uh, looks like they rise and hit a max in May, um, which I, I think that looks about right in, in 2018. Yeah, and then kind of move back down again mm -hmm. and um, get close to, and looks like month 11, they're close to where they were in month one. So it's kind of a, looks like they've kind of cycled up and down and back again. So And back again, for sure. Um, so we might take a look at another year's data. Uh, why don't we look at 2017's data? We'll put it side by side and see if that pattern is similar. So again, you know, look at the 2017 data. Is it 
following the same behavior across the months. Uh, and if there's anything you're wondering about here. And um, I know it, it appears it is doing this kind of same kind of behavior where it, it's rising up, kind of hitting a max around month five or May. It's going back down. It's hitting kind of a low in September, October, around there, and then starts climbing back up again uh, to close to where it uh, left off at in month one. But, uh, oh, I noticed something else here that's kind of okay. interesting. It uh, it appears, and I, I haven't looked at every single month, but I'm looking across here. It looks like every month in 2018 is higher than its course month in 2017. Is that right? Is that what I see? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm seeing too. It looks like if you read from left to right, there's been a uh, an increase from the month of one year to the same month of the next year, if I said that right. Um, like, for right. example, so it's almost, uh, not, not, well, it's, it seems, it, and it varies from month to month, but it's anywhere from, it seems like one and a half to two or more uh, parts per sure. month higher. Yeah. Um, Makes you wonder, let's see, what if we went back and looked at some previous years? Maybe we would, what if we jumped back, say, uh, I think we have this data all the way back to 2006. Um, let's go look at those two, uh, 2006 and 2007. Again, where if you look down a column, I think you get the sense of this kind of a cycle where it's it's rising, you're hitting a peak around month five, then it goes back down, you hit a low around month nine, and then it comes back up, so it seems to go up and down. But if you read across, wow, 2006 is, uh, it's a little bit lower than 2007, but it's a lot lower than 2018. Right, right. So, a lot of stuff going on with this data, and and what we'd like to do at this point is start thinking about how you know what tools do we have that we can use to maybe uh, get a better sense of what's going on. So now we're going to turn to uh, we're going to use the Inspire in this webinar, but uh, uh, as was noted. Uh, these activities, all of them, these data sets were set up for both the TI-84 and the Inspire. So whichever platform you're using, uh, we've got some files uh, that have this data preloaded and ready to, to an analyze. So, you're, for, so for example, your students would not have to type these in from scratch. Okay, so on this uh, TI-Inspire file on carbon dioxide levels, I think Curtis is going to go ahead and move this giving the same background I talked about before. Uh, and then we've got this uh, list and spreadsheet page where we have the column for the month uh, running from 1 to 12, okay, and that's January through December. And then these other columns, C, CO18, CO17, the CO is just standing for carbon dioxide. And the last two digits there is corresponding to the year. So CO18 were, was that data that we saw for 2018. Uh, CO12 over here, that would be the same data for the year 2012. So we have uh, all of that data here. And, um, you know, we were just looking at it numerically, uh, something we could try. Um, let's see, I think we started out looking at 2018. Why don't we open up a data and statistics page? And down here on the horizontal, let's look at uh, the month. We'll put the month of the year along the horizontal. And then uh, on the vertical, let's look at the CO2 levels for 2018. So this will be our CO18. 
and that's a great visual. And just like we noted with the numbers, kind of just looking at them numerically, this is now much more striking. We we looks like a kind of a sine wave uh, where we see that uh, behavior. And you know, this data is not just coming out from under a rock. Okay, these are CO2 levels over the year. Uh, some questions your students might have is, oh, we've got this thing that seems to be fluctuating with the passage of the year, like there's some kind of an annual cycle going on. Um, let's go ahead and add um, another year's worth of data on the vertical there. Let's add the Y variable uh, for the year seven, 2017. Just a note here, Tom, I, I use the context menu. So I, on my computer, I right clicked, but on a, on a handheld, uh, on a calculator, you would use control and the menu key uh, right. over here on that. Great. Text menu there. So just a just kind of a side note to add the Y variable. Which year would you like me to add? Uh, let's go ahead and do uh, uh, year 17. Those were the first two. That we looked at okay and again we're, we're seeing that kind of same cycle but notice that there's a, a shift up and uh, curtis has gotten rambunctious and he's going ahead and doing some other years i like it <laughs> so he's added wow so we're seeing really Two kinds of patterns here. One of them is the pattern across the year is this cycle. But from year to year, it seems like the entire curve is getting shifted up. That's it's really interesting. I um, think and we, we could add as many of these as we like to see if it keeps continuing. Um, Curtis is just going one year back each time. I think. Uh, on this next page, this is one where all of the years uh, are plotted. And it's really striking that we basically get these kind of vertically parallel um, sine curves. I, I'm referring to them as sine curves, but it, it, you know, just the way those are behaving, we would suspect that for any particular year, we might be able to fit a sine curve to it pretty well. But we're also seeing this increase from year to year. Uh, you know, in fact, to kind of maybe think about that year to year increase, uh, what we might like is uh, what if we just did the spread of temperatures in a box plot for a single year? Oh, okay. So you'd like me to insert another page here? Yeah, let's go ahead and insert. Okay. And I'll tell you this time, let's just go ahead and put um, uh, the, the data for year 18 on the horizontal. And then uh, let's We're do a box plot. plot. Okay. So this is basically taking that set of 12 months of temperature, uh, not temperatures, excuse me, uh, CO2 uh, levels. And we're going to plot a statistical box plot for it. Okay. And then we could compare year to year. We could do a box plot for another year, like year 17. And we can see that that kind of a similar spread of the data, but it's all been shifted. Um, so we could continue in a similar fashion to add additional years. So we're just doing a great job of kind of very quickly. You can see how easy this is to add each year. I'm going to point out that he's adding an X variable this time, whereas last time he was adding a Y variable. Right. And this is actually, we're looking at kind of comparing sets of univariate data in a way with these boxes. Yeah, but I'm noticing something here, Tom, and you had me start at 18 for a reason, I think. That oh, I, yeah. even though yeah. I don't really have a vertical axis here, because effectively these could have been in any order that I just did it, but I, I went backwards in history. 
and now I have I do have a nice visual um, kind of a of, of time as time goes on um, what's happening with the the medians there. Yeah, and Curtis brings up a good point there that if we had started with the year 2006, for example, then these um, box plots would have um, shifted up with each one that we new one that we added so it would shift the existing ones up and put in the new ones at the bottom uh, that would have the effect of uh, we would see the uh, the lower data values on the left excuse me um, I said that backwards we would have uh, it, it would switch the, this graph around right we would have um, the year 18 data would be at the very bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So then it would kind of have kind yeah, of a. It would go down from left mm -hmm. to right because our yeah. years would be going down. We had yeah. done them in the other order. So that brings up an interesting point. As students are, are playing with this data, and one of the things that you guys have built into these activities really is just here's the data, let your students kind of go and play and come up with some of the things that they can think of to do with this data. So that's some of what you're doing here, Tom. And I, I think that does bring up an interesting point to, to have students think about the visuals that they're creating as they're trying to um, talk about um, this data a little bit. It, it's important for them to think about the construction of the, of the visual as well and what information it actually shows. Right, and I, I would hope this is, this is not a march through everything for every student that they make every plot. This would be a much better activity if each group of students would make their own plots, um, and then the kids would share the different ways that they were thinking about um, investigating the data. Right. It's pretty right. striking here to notice that the variability, um, like like 2010, there was a little bit bigger variability because the interquartile range was a bit a little bit larger than it was, say, in 2012. But the variability has been pretty consistent across those those years. Yeah. And we're seeing this. Um, I mean, it almost looks like a kind of a linear movement of the median as the years progress. So these box and uh, these box plots are showing well that center line in each box plot is the median. Um, we've got a uh, for each year of this data we've gone ahead and uh, calculated a mean across the year. And so Curtis uh, is going to go to uh, another list and spreadsheet page where we have that yearly mean CO2 data. Okay. So here's the data for you, Tom? Right, yeah. And in fact, this has both the mean for that year as well as the standard deviation for what it's worth. Um, and so if we wanted to plot the data, the mean CO2 for each year, uh, here we've got one that's uh, already constructed this, here. Yeah, it's basically comes straight off of that uh, list and spreadsheet plot. And there's already been a regression, linear regression, uh, plotted for that mean data. Okay, so again, this is the mean CO2 for each year. Uh, and then we can see that uh, this increasing line, uh, the slope of that line, that 2.26, mm -hmm. is suggesting that's kind of the average increase across the whole year that we're seeing. So for each increase in a year, the overall average CO2 has gone up 2.26 parts per million. Right. And I, I want to point out that some of you who are really into statistics might worry a little bit about the, the residuals. If you want your kids to investigate a little better fit for that line, um, that would be another good exercise for them. Um, just to see if they could do some transformation and get a little better fit. Yeah, I see some interesting things here. I imagine the residuals will have kind of an interesting pattern here. Um, it almost doesn't look, looks like we're under predicting a little bit and then over predicting for the mid, middle 
portion and then under predicting again at the yeah. end. So that's yeah. it's not a kind of kind of curved but, relationship. But for, you know, algebra kids um, beginning thinking about this, I, I wouldn't get too upset about it. Yeah. No, this is a nice investigation. Some some fun things. Um, some fun things here. Um, Tom, was there anything else on this page? You uh, no, no. I think you know it might be good. Maybe we can just go ahead to uh, something you were looking at, uh, Curtis. That yeah. I think is pretty neat. So one of the things I noted, and this again is just you know Tom and Gail assigned me. Hey, what do you notice in this data? Um, and so one of the things I noted was was kind of the combined grouping. If I took all of the data. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit here um, to problem number uh, three here. I took all of the data and I, I um, grabbed the, the months since t January 2006 and just went sequential all the way across. And I made a scatter plot of that data against the CO2 and parts per million. We kind of get this um, jagged looking um, but slightly increasing pattern. Um, of CO2 parts per million um, as we go through through the years, and I thought, boy, this would be an interesting um, piece to try to to model. There's not really a function that I know uh, off the top of my head that that really fits this. Um, but then I'm thinking about it. Um, we do have that kind of mean um, going up by by an, a linear pattern of some sort, and then each year we have some sort of a sinusoid, I figured, well, maybe we can put those two together uh, to create a, a model that, that fits kind of this, this pattern over time. Um, and so on the next page here, um, I went ahead and, and took the sinusoid from 2008 and kind of played with that a little bit along with the, the intercept um, 380 coming off of uh, this linear regression that could be performed here um, on this data. So I went ahead and did a linear regression, noted my 0.19 here uh, and my y-intercept, and then I just said, well, I'm going to add to that uh, the sinusoid from 2008, and then I made a few adjustments. One thing, Tom, I think you noted, um, when you compare doing a sinusoid on each on any individual year, the period isn't quite right. Is that what you mentioned earlier? Yeah, if we did a, a sine curve fit for any particular year, it the period ends up being, um, it looks like it, the regression comes out to around 11 months instead of 12. And right. causing that is this, uh, the increase across the year that we're seeing from year to year. Um, and by uh, accounting for that linear growth in the uh, mean CO2 level, um, if you were to take uh, 2 pi, 6.28, and divide by 0.53, you'd get something very close to 12, a 12 month period. So this is really a nice thing that uh, uh, Curtis has analyzed. Also, I'd look at that coefficient of x near the front. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember the linear regression we did earlier, we got a 2.26, but that was from year to year. 12 times that 0.19 is that 2.26. So this is where x is measured in months. Right. That's why we're getting a different One reminder there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's, I'd have to point out to my students that 120 months would be the equivalent of 10 years. Right. <laughs> on the horizontal <laughs> axis. Yep, something to just uh, kind of be aware of there. But yeah, this was my uh, my first attempt at playing with this after you guys had shown me the data and said, well, what else do you think you could do with it? So that was uh, something that I, I came up with. And I know you had one more example in here, Tom. I don't know. Um, if you want to jump over there and look at that real quick? Uh, sure, yeah. This was just the... Uh... So I'll skip back here to uh, problem 1.2.1 and let you go ahead. Uh, right, yeah, and this is actually what I was referring to a little bit of, uh, 
little while ago that if you tried to fit a sine curve to just one year's worth of data, uh, so on 2.2, I think that's where those are shown. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the next, oh, maybe the 2.3. So this is the coded data first. Yeah, yeah. so the six is no, standing for year six, right. uh, 2006, 2006 month, month one. Yeah. Uh, and so we go to, oh, I know, yeah. So this is plotting the uh, data across the year. And what you're seeing here is the 2006 and 2007 in the lower left, kind of back to back. And then they we're jumping to 2017, 2018 in the upper right. So you can see this sharp increase. Um, if you're worried about uh, uh, kind of a trick that's done here is to kind of get a nice spacing of the points. Uh, these are actually, these months were plotted as categorical data, and that's why we have this kind of mess along the bottom in terms of the list. Uh, but we're really after the visual here. So you're seeing um, two consecutive years, but spaced 10 years apart, if that makes sense. So there's 06, 07 down the lower left, and 2017, 2018 in the upper right. And you can see right. a quite striking increase across that many years. Now that brings up an interesting point, Tom, when you think about creating these visuals and having students model data um, and figure out ways that they can display the data and tell the story that they're trying to tell. Um, they, they have to think about the ways that they can do this because I'll, I'll show, I'll kind of pull back the, uh, the, uh, curtain a little bit on this. Um, so if I take this data and I go back to its numeric kind of origins here um, and, and we pace it out, you'll notice that we really don't get the picture we were looking for. I mean, it's there, but it's buried in the scale that we have here. And we kind of tricked it up just a little bit um, to make it, make it work to show what we were trying to show such that the um, such that the scale looked appropriate um, based upon the dots that we had here. So we are, we're hiding 10 years worth of data that, that we're skipping over uh, hmm. on the picture, which is what my, my graph actually took into account, all the numeric pieces going by month instead of trying to include the year. Yeah. So. Um, Way to deal with that. So it's a really, I, I think it's a fascinating data set that you can do just a lot with. Uh, it's just some really interesting things to look at. So um, that's about it for this. I think it's probably time for us to switch over to uh, another modeling activity with Gail on uh, quarterback rating. All right. All right. Gail, you want to just jump to the TI Inspire? You want to look at the power? No, I'm jumping right to the TI Inspire. Okay. And so this is our question, who's the all-time National Football League passing quarterback? So you guys, before we go any farther, in the chat room, who do you think it is? This is all-time. Who do you think is the all-time National Football League passing quarterback? So put a few ideas in the chat window. Gail, you're Gail. looking to start fights out there, I think. <laughs> Ooh, far Joe Five, Montana. Go, Joe Montana. Brady. That would be Tom, I guess. <laughs> oh, we got two Brady. Brady. A couple of votes for Brady. What happened? Okay, the Breeze. I'm waiting for my for the one I'm looking for here. I don't know if I'm gonna get it. Maybe not. I don't know how I can get it. Well, let's go to the next page. One point two. And, That's and how so I can get it. there is a way that they rate these things. So if you go to page 1.2, so they tell me that Pat Mahomes had a, he's the Kansas City Chiefs quarterback, by the way, had a 108.9 rating. Um, the San Francisco quarterback had 102. Brady wasn't as, as good as the other ones. He had a 97% rating. Um, but my question is, what are these ratings based on and how are they calculated? These were their ratings for, I think, this last season, okay? So this is current season, not... Uh... Yeah, not overall. Okay. I think, okay. 
So let's look at the data, because that's what we always start with. And contrary to the data that we were looking at with the CO2, um, these data are just pretty much of a mess. And so basically what we have here are the number of touchdowns, the, um, all the kind of passing stats, which we'll show you on the next page. Um, but there's not really a pattern, they're just kind of a mess. Um, so go to the next page, please. Curtis, next page, there. So you can see we have the touchdowns they've made. Now this is career touchdowns. Um, the pass completions, the yards gained, um, the um, a number of attempts, and the number of interceptions that they've had. So we can scroll through the data, and um, so I, I think it was my, I think it was Brett Farr, one of the guys that you, somebody mentioned here. I think Brett's probably one of the leading um, interception guys, isn't he? He should have a lot of interceptions, uh, if I remember correct. And I'm from Wisconsin. And yeah, see, uh, he has 336. A yeah, he, he was kind of interesting in leading interceptions here. Um, we could actually go and we could look. Um, just for fun, why don't you go to a, um, insert a new page? Okay. And in stats page. Stats, and we're going to go to across the bottom. We're going to put interceptions. And then maybe um, just to see what it looks Gosh. like. Put, yeah. <laughs> and in stats, you want to ask if he was an outlier. Um, Put the click up there and let's try. Oh, I don't know. Let's add. Um, let's add uh, completions. C O M P. Yeah. And look at what we got. So it looks like there's kind of a relationship. We could have a conversation about what you're noticing. Um, so far, really. He's up there, right? But he's high in both completions and interceptions, which is one of the reasons why he might be a candidate for being an all-time player. Who's that guy down in the lower corner that's not very good in interceptions and not very good in um, 30 and 1,011? Hmm. We could go check the data, see who that is. One of the things that you want your students to do is to play with things like this and kind of investigate the set of data as they're thinking about how am I ever going to rate, use these data to rank the, the quarterbacks? Um, I've got all these data, but what am I going to do to put them together? Okay, so that's my next question. So let's have you think for a minute about um, what would you do? You've got all these data on 57 quarterbacks. So offer something on the um, chat about what you might try to do. What would be, what would you think your kids would do? And by the way, this is a problem that middle school kids can do as well as high school kids. Um, middle school kids, you might not want to give them all 57. You might just want to give them, you know, quarterbacks who played in the last 10 years or something like that. Um, but if you have a thought about how you might want to put them together, um, do something to come up with a rating number. And people do this all the time. They rate people. Um, they, they are like, they rate people, they rate things, um, they rate your merchandise. Um, how do they put all, they rate airlines. How do they put all of this together um, to come up with these numbers that are, are used to say which one is best? Um, anybody got some ideas here? So while they're thinking, while you guys are throwing things out. And by the way, I've done this with kids and they're actually really pretty good with thinking about different ways to think about um, how they might put that together. So let's go to page 1.7, um, Curtis, and we'll check that one out. Does this make sense for a model? I'm just adding them all up. I'm adding the number of completions to the number of touchdowns to the number of yards gained. And then I went and minus I, and I suspect you guys would know why I'm going minus I, because the interceptions aren't good. Um, does this make sense for a model? What do you guys think? Say something in the chat. Sure, about that makes that. sense to me, but I, I'm, I question adding yards, touchdowns, and completions all together. I think that some of those might be strongly 
um, associated. You might get some doubling up of, of people who've had lots of experience um, getting much higher ratings than maybe people who don't have as many years in the league. So does what Curtis said make sense to you? Because this is a big deal for middle school students as well as for high school students. That when you're trying to compare things, you have to find some way to get a common denominator, a common, some kind of way that you can use the same standard. And one of the problems here is that if you looked at some of the lists, um, some of those quarterbacks are young quarterbacks. Um, they haven't been playing very long. And some of them, um, like Brett Favre, played for a very long time. Um, and so how do I make that kind of um, resolve that fact that I need to account for the experience, the number of years of experience, which contributes to the opportunities to get big numbers in some of these categories. So probably maybe, the, Can we divide by maybe, can we do something with the number of times that they played? Yep. And that's what we're going to do they threw the ball? By, by the attempts. And that's a great way to neutralize the, um, the experience is to divide by the number of attempts that they've made. Um, but now, if we're here, we're still in a little bit of a fuzzy place um, because we're still adding together strange units. Um, we're adding, you know, like the yards gained is going to be, that's a big number. Um, and the interceptions won't be nearly as big or the touchdowns won't be nearly as big. So somehow or other, it would be good if we could find a way to cope with these things. And I'm telling you just some of the things that we've come up with. I'm pretty sure that my students have come up with lots of other um, plans, but let's go down. Um, let's go to the, the an alternate strategy, which is kind of a cool strategy. Um, so we go to the, keep going. And by the way, the asterisks are the people who are still current. So that's why we have Drew Brees in there and Tom Brady. Um, okay, back up. There it is. So one of the ways we might think about this is we have to get some way to, to bring us all together in, in a kind of a scale. So if you go back to the net, page 1.12, I think. I think you want to be on this page. Uh, I want to go back to the, no, I want to go back to the 1.11 maybe. I want to go back to the names of these guys, okay. If you scroll down this, this list of names, um, and there's a bunch, there's all these ratings that are over there, okay? Um, actually, no, don't go there. Go back another page, Curtis, sorry. I think where you wanna be is on page 2.2 .2 and all the way at the front edge. Okay, that's it. Yes, yeah, thank you, Curtis. Okay, so why did I, why did I highlight Drew Brees there? Because if you go across Drew Brees' row, you're going to find that he has one of the, he's the highest one in the number of, um, in the number of completions. Drew Brees has had more completions than anybody else. And if Curtis goes back over to the name of the list of the names and goes down, he's going to keep going down and the, and the way I found these is by, okay, and there he hits number 20. Number 20 is Otto Graham. Otto Graham played a long time ago, but if we go across his row, Otto Graham turns out to be the guy that has the most interceptions, the most touchdowns, and the most yards gained. And so he's kind of the, the, the most person. And I, if you go to, um, isn't there a scatter plot down here in the files? Um, that one of the ways you could actually see that. I think I have it in the scatter plot. Um, is there oh, one in there? Curtis, there it is. Yeah. Yep. See that little point up there? That would be Otto Graham. He's got the most fractions of touchdowns and fractions of yards. Um, and so basically, going back to our. Um, categories there um, on the previous page on 2.2, what I did is if you go all the way over there, you're going to see the, the touchdowns per attempt, and then if you keep on going across, so 
got to kind of make it. Okay, keep going, keep going. There you go. So I took everybody's um, touchdowns and divided them by autogram. Um, so autograms, um, touchdown was per attempt was 0.0514. I divided everybody okay. by that. And I did okay. the so we took touchdowns per attempt. And we divided it by autograms. autograms, touchdowns per attempt. Okay. Right, that's why it's one. So I'm trying to scale everybody in terms of the best person with respect in to that category. Okay. Yep. And then I did the same thing with the completions, and that was Breeze. So I divided everybody by 0. 0.6731. And I did the same thing for the other two, both of which were autogram. And now I've got this little set of um, kind of pulled everything into the same scale that so they're the big numbers have been kind of scaled down because they're all relative to who was the best in that category. And so now if I go back up to the top, I'm pretty comfortable adding up all of these things. So I can go back to a formula that says add. So if you go up to the top and, and over, all right, if you see up at the top up there, go up one more. So if I take all the touchdowns divided touchdowns per attempt divided by auto well, auto score yeah yard attempt divided by that should have been breeze's score i think you meant say, yeah maybe. i did mean breeze's score or no here it is completions is breeze yeah completions divided by breeze interceptions divided by okay all right so I can add them all up. So I've got touchdowns, yards, and completions added, and then subtracting off the interceptions. And now I'm ready to look at them. And so if I can just, if you can figure out, I can scroll through, but I'm on a spreadsheet. So if I select that whole column, select the next column, go to sort. So underneath of actions, there's this option called sort. Right, and that's okay. Find that. I'm going to sort sorting column on. R. That's where the ratings are, and because Curtis has highlighted both of those columns, I want to sort it in descending order because I want to know the best guy at the top. It's going to sort the um, my ratings, but it's going to take along the name. So I'm going to say okay, and there I go. So the number one quarterback rating is Aaron Rodgers with a 2.480, and I'm from I was right. Wisconsin, and I think that's way cool. <laughs> now, just because you came up with the formula, should we all be suspicious of uh, the fact that you came up with a formula that puts Aaron Rodgers at the top? Uh, you could be. <laughs> all right, but let's go back. Um, let's go back. And I got another formula here, and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, so somebody sent a different formula um, that comes from something from the Dana Center. Um, so it's okay. a really interesting story. Okay, so here's the formula, if Curtis can scroll down to pull it up. This is the formula that's used by the NFL. Um, it's actually, you can look it up. Um, it comes in different forms. I did the formula in Minnesota one year, and they told me that Green Bay Packers did the wrong formula. And they gave me a different formula, and I made my students do the algebra to show that the two were equivalent, and they were equivalent. Um, but it's kind of a, it, it's a weighted to account for um, kind of the fact that um, touch, uh, interceptions are really bad and touchdowns are good, but interceptions are way more worse than touchdowns. There's two things that might bother you guys about that, about the formula. You see the divided by A's, which we talked about. Um, what two numbers in there are a little bit worrisome? Anybody want to think about what those numbers might be? So basically, in my book, the 24 is a little worrisome, and so is the 50. Um, and I've had people guess all sorts of reasons for the 24 and the 50. I, as nearly as I can tell, and I've done some reading and looking up on this stuff, they're in there so that the ratings come out to be around 100. Um, people get get very confused if the rating comes out to be 0.3, and the top rating you can have is 0.3. People are much better to say, oh, the best rating is 0.99 or something like that. 
Um, and that's, this is a space where you can ask a lot of questions that kids in middle school and ninth and 10th and 11th grade can all pay attention to. What's the maximum rating you can get out of here? What's the minimum? Um, you know, are there numbers that you can't possibly get for the ratings? Um, if I wanted to maximize my quarterback rating, um, what should I do in, besides minimize my, touch, my interceptions? Um, but you can ask all sorts of questions to get kids to reason and make sense. Um, and to try different numbers as long as they play around with a spreadsheet. Um, I think that's a really good thing for them to learn how to do. Um, and so this is just like a, a cool question to ask students to play with, um, to come up with the ratings. And of course, if we go back up to the, um, the data base on um, 1.9, I think if you go all the way over to the end, I think I actually did the formula. Did I do that one there? Is it in there or is it in another data set? I think, I think it's on this page. Yep, there it is. And now Curtis is going to show us a little cool thing. Um, so I could sort again, but Curtis is going to show us another way to pull out um, something that will help us know was my Aaron Rodgers a fluke? So just another way to kind of mess with data or have students be able to look at and explore data. Um, on a notes page, um, you can insert a, a slider to control a variable. So I'm going to just insert a slider, call it I. Um, I'll give it a minimum value of uh, one and a maximum value. I think you said there were 57 people in this data set, so I'll just. Yep. I'm going to put the, the uh, step size to be one because I want to skip through this data one at a time. Um, I'm going to minimize that that um, value and then I'll, I'll go ahead and show the variable. That'll be that'll be okay. So now I've got this little clicker that I can navigate back and forth through. Really nice. And down here, I've got a math box already inserted. Um, and so I'm just going to type the name, and I forget what the name of that uh, quarterback. Okay. So I'm going to type the name of this column here. I'm going to call it uh, quarterback. I could have selected this from the VARS key as well, but I'm just going to type it in. And I'm going to type in a quarterback, and I'm going to use a square bracket. Um, so, Curtis, I want to point something out. So it took me a while to realize that when I tried to type in a variable, if it didn't get black, I hadn't gotten the right typing for the variable. It, that helps me catch my spelling mistakes a lot. <laughs> me too. Helps me catch mine. Um, and so when I hit enter here, it's going to return back the quarterback that's associated with that value, number one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and then, Gail, you called it rating up there in the, the value up there. So I'm gonna, I've got another math box here. Um, and so I will just type in rating um, and do that square brace again and go by I. And what we're just doing is using the, the list um, value. Um, so we're just going through the, that list and getting the value in one, two, three, four, uh, that's associated here. So now I've got Mark Bolger's uh, quarterback rating, career quarterback rating uh, popping up here. And as I can scroll through these, I can. You want to go all the way to 44. You want me that's to go to Aaron Roger. You said you want me to go to 44. Okay. Oh. And Roger. There, Aaron Rodgers. Is 103. Yep. And uh, I, I think that might be higher than anybody else. I think it was, and Russell is number 55. He was number 100, had 100. Anybody else have a three digit? I don't know if there's any others with a three digit. I No, there aren't. I actually three. looked through them all. There's nobody else with a three digit career quarterback rating. That's great. So, so I mean, it's kind of interesting that we get the same rating out of those two formulas, but I do have to tell you, that my students have come up with other formulas. They've tried regressions. Um, they've done all sorts of interesting things to um, come up with their own ratings of what the, who the leading quarterback should be. Um, and I also, another extension that you can use here 
is the um, college football quarterback rating is not the same formula as the one used by the NFL. So you can bring in a, a, their, their rating, um, and you can have your students make up a rating formula for the quarterbacks in your high school uh, um, league or something like that. So it's a, an interesting um, excursion um, for kids to think about the way they could use math and numbers um, to make sense out of a situation. And if they don't like rating quarterbacks, um, you could probably find another rating situation in the materials. We have one that has to be uh, due to with rating posters in a competition. Um, but this is a, a nice activity to get kids involved in thinking about different ways for rating. So I think we got um, two minutes for Tom to just talk about the third um, activity, but maybe not go into it very much. So I'm going to okay. turn it back to Tom. Okay. Uh, so yes, the the third activity here we um, the ones we built is uh, actually one based uh, on data that is in that uh, uh, gamey volume, uh, which is was really influential in the way we were thinking about things. Uh, so a mantis is like a praying mantis, and the idea is of modeling uh, how far are, will they strike. What distance will they jump at prey as uh, depending on how much food is is in it in their stomach um, and so uh, the data here is food measured in um, let's see centigrams, and then the striking distance is measured in millimeters uh, and just cutting to the chase um, this is We'll look at a scatter plot of this data. I can get a data and statistics page to pop up. Sure. And so put food as be my independent deep. variable. Independent variable, okay. And then striking distance as our vertical. Uh, and just kind of cutting to the chase here, notice there's kind of a threshold that once you get to 70 centigrams of food, uh, they're not willing to go any distance to strike, okay? And what that leads to is uh, kind of a naturally considering a piecewise function where you have uh, a perhaps a reasonably linear fit for the data that in the range from uh, zero to 70, uh, and then it just bottoms at zero from there on out. So kind of a natural setting for a piecewise model. So we better switch to Curtis to get his thing in so Mike can sign us off. That's right. All right. So just really quickly, I'm going to cycle through. Boy, we got we nailed a bunch of stuff here. Um, I'm going to cycle through to this last page in the PowerPoint. Um, so we are planning to continue producing these uh, these modeling activities, ones uh, similar to the ones that you have tonight, which basically are going to be um, some, some data sets um, and then some instructions for how to kind of get your students started and then some expected maybe uh, student uh, output um, and ideas for, for ways that students may try to uh, model the data. We are planning to, to publish these activities on both the Math Inspired and TI-84 Activity Central um, locations. They'll be um, called out as mathematical modeling um, in both of those locations. So it'll be a kind of a top category you can click on and then we'll underneath of that we'll highlight those four ratings that, that Gail went over this, this uh, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, ratings, optimization, prediction, and simulations. And we'll probably have a couple of activities underneath of each of those by the end of this uh, project. So I just wanted to point that out and make sure that you are aware these are going to be available on, on the TI website. So, Mike, I think we can turn it back over to you to wrap us up. Thanks so much. As we begin to wrap things up tonight, if you have any last minute questions for Curtis or Gail or Tom, uh, please try to get those asked. I know we don't have a lot of time, but they'll do their best to get those questions answered. At the very beginning of the webinar, we mentioned uh, that uh, for one lucky winner tonight, we're giving away a T-Cube International Conference registration, and tonight's lucky winner 
is Megan Tracy. So Megan, we'll be giving you an email, sending you an email in a couple of days to give you a little more information about the uh, upcoming TQ International Conference and your free re registration. But uh, I encourage everyone to check out our website and uh, learn a little more about the upcoming TQ International Conference. To receive a certificate of attendance, please go ahead and click the link in the chat window. Also, this is linked for those documents tonight, uh, which I said are going to be important, especially uh, for either an Inspire or an 84 user, so you get uh, all the lists for both. Um, if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Thanks so much, Curtis, Gail, and Tom, for everything you shared tonight. We really appreciate it. Great. Yep. Thank you. Glad to do it. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. I agree. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.